Father, we just praise your holy name, Father God. We thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We thank you, Father. Oh, Father, we thank you for the time that you've chosen us for. We thank you for everything. We praise you for this little bit of comparative peace that we're, you're giving us right now, Father, before the calamities and the judgments come down so hard and so fast that many of us will be in an absolute state of shock, while others of us will be falling to our knees, giving you glory and singing your praises. Thank you for choosing us for a time such as this. We praise you for every drink of water. We praise you for every bite of food. We thank you, Jesus, for the sacrifice. We thank you for being our Lord. We thank you and we love you. We love you, Lord. We praise you for the presence of the Holy Spirit. We praise you for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We praise you for everything, everything that you do, Father God, on behalf of all of us, for the calamities, Father, that are about to befall this earth, that they should save many, many more millions of souls that otherwise would not have made it. Thank you, Jesus. We praise your holy name. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Well, here we are. Uh, yeah, we're doing a special program this evening. If you, well, if you haven't figured it out already, uh, and uh, it's uh, right now. It's entitled "The Near Death Experience of Sister Sherry Welsh." Uh, however, we may, you know, I don't know what we'll actually finally uh, uh, entitle it when we roll it live. Uh, what we're doing is a podcasted, uh, pre-recorded show. And we're glad that you could join us. This is a uh, kind of be. I, I'm excited about this program tonight, folks. And, and the reason why is because of what the scripture says. Uh, and I live in continuous anticipation of more revelations of, of mysteries uh, bubbling up into our psyche, being made aware of them, uh, being able to live for them, being able to have them uh, uh, inspire us. Uh, to because the times that we have ahead of us, they're going to be hard enough. And for those who do not understand, they're going to have an extra hard time. Um, when we see the size of the kingdom, when we see the size and the glory and the awesomeness of our Father, the awesomeness of our Lord Jesus, when we're able to look out through the Hubble or the Spitzer Space Telescope and see all of the stars, when we look at Daniel 12 where it says that those who lead many to righteousness shall shine like the stars forever and ever, when you, when you see how big this is, when you understand how awesome heaven is, when you understand the glory, the very essence of Jesus and how he was in the beginning with God and he was God, and that he sang ultimately all of creation into existence, that nothing was made uh, without him, and everything was made through him. And when you see how big this is, and you realize, when you get little hints of the glory, a little hints of the stupendousness of all of creation, of all of glory itself, heaven, uh, understanding uh, these things, when these new revelations rise up before you, and they become lodged into your heart. They come imbued into the very molecules of your very existence. When you make that transformation, at that point, something happens to you. Uh, and you, can, you feel and you believe and you just know through faith in your heart that no matter how th hard things get, no matter how difficult they get, no matter how bumpy the road ahead of us becomes, there's nothing, nothing that could cause you to do anything but to fall to your knees and praise God. No matter how hot, no matter how miserable, no matter how hungry, no matter how frightful and scary and horrible all the things are that are going on around us, you know that it's but a tiny, tiny little speck of our existence in all of creation that indeed the challenges that we're supposed to be and will be, amen, going through uh, in the next, uh, well, it appears prophetically, three years. Uh, hopefully the evacuation mission is around uh, sometime in the early part of 2019, maybe a little bit earlier. Who knows? We don't know. We can get excited. Uh, what I do is I look at the prophecies and the dreams and the visions and I stitch them together like a little puzzle because I'm curious. I want some kind of an idea. Uh, I'm sure that we'll be so busy when things get cataclysmic, utterly, utterly, utterly cataclysmic every single day, uh, and we're walking, you know, uh, literally, we're living, you know, Psalms 91, uh, when, when we, it gets like that, we'll be so busy and so full of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of God uh, that, uh, and being translated to different parts of the, um, uh, uh, the earth, uh, I almost said the universe, and I wonder to myself, see, I have a, 
I always wonder to myself how big this really is. See, because I've heard testimonies of those who have been translated. I wonder what translated means for those of you who don't understand it. Uh, I didn't always. And that, that is, it, 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 it's when, um, it's what happened to Philip when he, was, when he was ministering to the eunuch. You know, basically he just, all of a sudden he showed up in another place. Um, this translation, it's when you are, when your body, soul, spirit, and that would be who, you know, what makes up who you are, uh, even in your transformed, born again state, uh, here on this earth, when that moves from uh, one place to another supernaturally. And in some cases, according to the testimonies of some incredibly anointed people that uh, just have been a powerful blessing to all of us who listen to such mysteries, uh, sometimes you can be translated and your body will stay in one place, but another, I don't know, version of your body will move uh, to another part of the world and you'll be able to minister. So you'll appear just like a normal human while where your original body is, is sitting in bed, sleeping or whatever. And you're actually in China, so speaking Chinese and ministering to the Chinese people. I mean, it's just so amazing the things that we have to look forward to. And I wonder sometimes how big this is in the sense that could it be bigger than just planet Earth? You know, we see in the scripture, in because uh, every time I read, read the scripture, of course, I, everybody says this, but I think there's limits to all, you know, all of us, what we, what we wonder. A lot of us tend to, to contain our wonder. We say, well, you know, uh, I just don't believe that because, uh, you know, I don't know, I just, uh, I never heard of that before and that just doesn't sound right to me or whatever the reason is. Uh, you know, some, so-and-so never taught that and I'm a follower of so-and-so or whatever. Uh, you know, I, I, I love uh, to be able to look at the scripture with an innocent childlike set of eyes and ask the amazing questions, the questions that no one would dare to answer, because I wonder, and I wonder, uh, you know, if we get, you know, I always imagine that we might get Andy, little bags of Andy's candies when we get things right. You know, we were sitting in front of Jesus at the marriage supper, and he's up in front of this big, awesome whiteboard completely covered with, with gold, you know, embossed uh, uh, frame around it, just beautiful, and he's answering and doing a question and answer session, and he goes, hey, you, uh, 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 Johnny Baptist, here, you get, you get it, some extra Andy's candies because you guessed that one right. I always hope that I might get a couple b little bags of extra Andy's candies because, you know, I love them and I, I do have some behind me here, praise God. But anyway, the point is, I, you know, we see in the scripture, Proverbs 25, verse 2, it says, uh, it says uh, um, it's the glory of God. And I'm doing this all from memory, it's from memory, but it's the glory of God to conceal at the matter and the glory of kings to search out, search out a matter. And then you've got Malachi 3.16, uh, where the Lord clearly says that he rewards those. It writes them into a book of remembrance uh, because they're talking about him. They fear him. They, uh, they are awed by him. Uh, he's talking about a group of people that were just, you know, talking about him in awe and fear and how he wrote them into a book of remembrance and that he was going to save their souls like, like he would his own son. Uh, it's so exciting. When you get your arms around the fact that our Heavenly Father is enamored, touched, moved, um, uh, moved in a, in a hu huge way. Uh, when we are awed by him, when we are wondering about his glory, wondering about how big all of creation might be, you know, the sons of God, you know, all of creation groans for the manifestation of the sons of God. Why is that in the Bible? What's the point of that? Why don't they just say all the angels in heaven groan? What's the whole deal with the whole all of creation groans? Well, wouldn't that include like the hundreds of billions of galaxies that are located in, you know, in any given sector of the universe out there? How many planets are there? How many civilizations are there? How many dimensions are there? How many parallel universes are there? How many trillions of life forms are there across this universe? How many, how big is this? How many of them are glorified? How many of them are in a fallen state? Surely we're not the only pebble on the beach. Could we be that arrogant? I hope not. I hope we're not. I hope we have a contrite spirit. I hope we are full of humility and we are grateful and fall into tears with the thought of every drop of blood that Jesus shed for us because we don't deserve it. This is way, way, way bigger than most of us can even imagine in our wildest dreams. So when I look at scriptures like, you know, uh, like in Matthew 24, starting with 29, where he says, after, uh, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will shed its light, stars will fall from the sky, the celestial powers will be shaken. And, um, 
and I'm going to go back over to the New King James because I was on another. I have a lot of translations. But anyway, uh, but anyway, listen to this. I'm going to jettison ahead here. Uh, and it says, in, and he's talking about all the things that, you know, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heaven and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the heaven. Did you know, folks, that according to the visions and the dreams of very anointed people over years of time uh, that, that were present in the rapture, that were right there, that were taken by our Father into the future, and were standing on the earth at the time that the rapture occurred, that nobody, nobody heard the sound of the trumpet, and nobody saw Jesus except the bride. And, of course, uh, the uh, people that she brings with her during the harvest, because God's not going to leave them behind. And that's in Matthew 22. Praise God. Those are the guests at the wedding supper. But, but the testimony is of all those, so many prophecies every time. My eyes, my, my ears perk up when there are little hints at mysteries of things that we ought to know, but we don't know. Extra biblical, awesome things. It's like Jesus leaning over to us and, and whispering into our ear and saying, hey, did you know that the only people on the entire 7 billion populated earth that are going to hear the, the the, the final trumpet, the, or the, you know, the sound of the last trumpet, when, when I come, are going to be the bride. They're the only ones who are going to hear it. And I'd be like, wow, Lord, thank you for sharing that with me. Well, that essentially is what a prophecy is like. Prophecies are extra biblical. They're supplemental. It's supplemental information on top of what we could possibly derive from the Holy Bible. Now, if they're in complete contrast to it, then that should be a warning Will Robinson. Uh, so they should flow in harmony. Uh, but, but uh, oh, my, how exciting it is. So when you look back at... Um, at the scripture in Matthew 24, uh, 29, 30, 31, uh, uh, you see uh, it says, The sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Well, guess what? It says, With power and great glory. It doesn't say a thief in a night. It doesn't say a thief in a night. It doesn't say a thief in a night. I do not believe, based upon the prophecies, dreams, and visions, no matter how close uh, the, the part about the sun being darkened and the moon not giving its light and the stars falling from heaven, no matter how close that aligns to Revelation 6, uh, 12 and 13, uh, which is the sixth seal, I do not believe that is referring to the sixth seal. I believe that that is referring to when Jesus comes back with his saints in Revelation 19, with all of his saints, with all of his saints, down to the earth uh, to establish the new millennial kingdom, to... Uh, uh, for the War of Armageddon, uh, for the cleanup uh, activity, uh, if you want to call it that, that, that Jesus is going to be doing at that time, as it says in the book of Jude, uh, when, uh, when the second from Enoch uh, prophesied, saying, uh, now, uh, uh, now the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints uh, to open up a can of whoop hiney uh, on the, exist, you know, ex the people who are still on the earth, that kind of thing. Praise God. That's all Revelation 19. That's all Jude. You know, that's all at the very, very end prior to the establishment of the Millennial Kingdom. So I know that there is a, is, there is a direct correlation between the – you could go back and say, well, that's the sixth seal. But then, then you would have to throw away all the prophecies all the dreams, all the visions that showed the rapture occurring like a thief in the night, like a thief in the night. Uh, you know, where Jesus shows up and says, and we're gone. Wham, we're out of here. We're on the rescue mission. We're flying off the planet heaven on two, on the wings, on the two wings of a great eagle. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I cannot wait. But here's the cool part. If that wasn't cool enough, but here's the cool part. The cool part is verse 31. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds. What are those? What are four winds? What are four winds? Not one jot or one tittle. It's pretty granular. That's got to be pretty important. And then it says, from one end of the heaven to the other, he will gather his, together his elect it doesn't say his bride. It says they will gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of the heaven to the other. Why does it say that? Why did I say from one end of the earth? If it's, if it's the rapture, why didn't it just say I'm gathering my bride from one end of the... Why, not, why doesn't it say I'm gathering my, the wise virgins from one end of the earth to the other? This is a curveball. Let him who have an ear hear. 
so, you know, to gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of the heaven to the other. I, you know, and you could say, well, it's just referring to heaven. You know, heaven where you know where, where the saints are in heaven with the Father and the city of God and all that kind of stuff, which you're going to hear a little bit about tonight uh, with uh, Sister Sherry. Praise Jesus. Uh, but but maybe it's bigger than that. Why are the four? Why is it, what's up with the four winds? Is, is heaven a windy place? Is it like? Whoosh, Four winds. Winds coming from the north and the south to the east to the west. Hold on to your bonnet, saints. The winds will blow it away. Why is it there? What does it mean? Is the implication that maybe that gathering of the elect is, I don't know, intergalactic perhaps? Could it be? Could this be bigger than planet Earth? How big is this? Questions, these kinds of questions make me pace the floor. I get excited about it. I love the scriptures like the scripture in the Bible that says, for nothing is secret that will not be revealed. This is Jesus speaking. For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. Wow. And then it warns us. It says, take heed how you hear. Forever who, forever has the humbleness of heart to consider it prayerfully. For whoever has, to him more will be given. Oh, good. More mysteries will be given to us with a hungry, humble, contrite heart. Yay. But whoever does not have, even what he seems to have will be taken away from him. Boy, that sounds like the strong delusion to me. Doesn't it sound like that to you? Because all of the church, all the churchies, you know, the churchianity churchies across the world, the arguably two billion people who think they're Christians but aren't really What's going to happen to them when all these amazing and indeed horrific things happen across the earth? Never mind World War III. Never mind the cataclysms. Never mind the tsunamis and the earthquakes and the, and the meteors splashing into the Atlantic Ocean and all the horrors there, the FEMA camps, and people getting drug away, all the horrible things that are coming uh, in just Revelation chapter 6. Never mind that, but what about the, 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 the wrath of God? Oh, my, and the alien invasions. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. They sure, certainly aren't from Earth, so technically they do qualify as aliens, don't they? Whether they are interdimensional, whether they are uh, inter whatever, it doesn't matter. They're not from here. Call them otherworldly beings. Call them fallen angelics. Call them fallen angels. Call them whatever you want to. Call them Tom, Dick, and Harry. You probably don't care. Coming here for the same reason. To work for the devil and to kill people. And deceive us and trick people. Oh, praise God. It's exciting. I love to look at the scriptures. I love, I think that a lot of the people who listen to this program love to learn about the mysteries of the Bible. One of the things that Sister Sherry saw and, and had something happen to her, and I'm not going to steal her thunder, but it had to do with this, what, what we today uh, know as the uh, six-pointed star, the Star of David. The people in the New Age refer to it as the Merkaba. <laughs> they, they say that it's like a, a ship, you know, because it's referred to as a Merkaba. The term Merkaba is referred to in Ezekiel 1, and everybody knows that's, well, it seems to me like it's a symbiotic spacecraft. It carries the throne of God in it. Living creatures that carry the throne of God. When Ezekiel looked up in chapter 1, he described pretty much, you know, and he got all those ancient aliens, folks, you know, all right, so you're off all. You know, call MUFON, you know. Folks, we just don't understand how big this is. This is the most amazing time the earth will ever see. It will have more glory, more miracles, more amazing. And guess what? These little tastes, these little glimpses into glory are just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, as I said in the last show that we did, uh, you know, we're not, you know, we're not even talking to the tip of the iceberg, folks. What we're talking about is like if you took a razor blade and you scraped a couple of ice molecules off the top of the iceberg, that's how little we have to understand about heaven with all of the people that have been taken to heaven. I believe that the scripture still stands true, uh, that I, has not, I have not seen nor ear heard uh, the things which God has stored up for those who love him. I think that if we took the aggregate sum total of every single testimony of every single person who has ever been taken to heaven, we put it into a giant big bowl of happiness and that scripture I hath not seen nor ear heard the things which God has stored up for those who love him is still applicable. I believe that what we have in store for us so far exceeds the glory of what has been revealed to us through God's mercy and love for us about heaven that what we're about to experience in such a very short time in comparison to the little bit of ugly we have to go through now. I mean, come on. Come on. 
it's going to be and is more huge than we could ever imagine in our wildest, most awesome, inspired, Holy Spirit-filled dreams. Praise God. Oh, man, we just don't know. Praise you, Jesus. And on that note, I'm going to go ahead and bring on Sister Sherry. Praise God. And she's going to tell us a little bit about who she, is, who she was, who she is, uh, uh, and, uh, and what, you know, the kind of work that she's trying to do on, on behalf of the Lord now at this time, you know, let people know things and to help them understand what she saw. She was shown things that some people would, you know, throw, well, you know, folks, I mean, come on. If anybody knows what it's like to have stones thrown on them, it's me. And I know she's getting thrown. You know, anybody who talks about any of the mysteries of the Bible who deviates from churchianity 101, who deviates from drinking, I'm not even talking about milk. Folks, the church of today drinks Similac. <laughs> For real. We have fallen, the, the churchianity across the world has fallen so deep in the seething sin and ignorance that they don't even qualify for being called milk drinkers, uh, you know, in, in, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, metaphor that Paul used. I would submit uh, they're, they're on Similac, if that. And so, uh, you know, some of these things I think are going to be exciting. I like to learn about these new things, and I hope that you do too. Uh, you know, about, uh, like, uh, we had a conversation briefly. Now, she didn't tell me hardly anything, uh, but we did touch on a couple of points. And one of the points was uh, about the six-pointed star, pun intended. And I think it's exciting because it's something that the Lord placed upon my heart a long, long time ago. So anyway, let's go ahead on this journey of exciting uh, revelation uh, to understand uh, the things that the Lord allowed Sister Sherry Welch to experience in her, ex well, in her supernatural touch of God uh, in her life. Uh, and I'm not going to ruin any of it. Well, let's just go ahead and bring her on. All the glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus, hallelujah. Are you there, Sister Sherry? Yes, hello, John, brother. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate this opportunity to share my testimony. Praise God. So glad to have you join us. God bless you. Thank you. Um, so I'll you just too. go ahead and hand the mic over to you and, and let you go ahead. And then if you, like, like we talked about before on the telephone when we were discussing this, uh, you know, if you touch upon something that's really exciting or something that I feel like the Lord may have revealed to me in the past or whatever, uh, I, I'm, I'll, I might jump in uh, and, uh, and share with the listeners, uh, you know, my, my notions uh, that, that might blend in harmoniously to, to your experience as well, uh, because uh, sometimes the Lord reveals mysteries to one person and then they get a confirmation from another and another. And it's like, that's, that, I survive off of those kinds of confirmations. That's how, sure. I, I don't you know what I mean, because when you move yeah. out of, you get off the Similac, you get off your baby bottle, now you're chugging, you know, a big glasses of milk, and then, oh, all of a sudden you're eating hot dogs, and then you finally get to the steak and a filet mignon, and then what do you do then? You know, you start going into these mysteries and wondering, wow, and as soon as you start getting into the meat, as soon as you start getting into the advanced understanding of the Scripture or the spiritual understanding of the Holy Bible, uh, that's, when, that's when the, uh, you know, the stones start flying, hallelujah. So it's always wonderful that the Lord will lead us to people uh, over time uh, that, that have had similar revelations and can and share them with you so that they're like, so you can go, oh, wow, praise God, I'm not losing my mind. You know what I mean? It's really <laughs> nice to hear someone else. Yes, well. yes, I understand. Well, um, you want me to start by just giving a little background on myself? Is that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, I am from Salt Lake City, Utah, and I grew up in a pretty middle class family. We did lots of boating and fishing and outdoorsy hunting. Um, I had a great mom and dad. I was raised very strict Mormon. Um, so I never even had it, my own King James Bible, but I, I always had the sense when I went to church that, that, that it just wasn't true. I just kind of closed my ears to it, and I insisted that, uh, 
they give all the young women. I wanted a real King James authorized Bible, and I made sure I got one. And I've been so grateful for that because it sure has revealed a lot to me. Um, I was a hard worker. I have a daughter who's just graduated from college, and I'm so proud of her. I was married for about five years, and my uh, husband developed uh, paranoid schizophrenia. We married very young, and I guess that comes on if it's going to happen in early adulthood. And it was real hard to deal with. I had to get a divorce, and so I was a single mom for a long time, and just a real hard worker, and just really lived for my daughter, and uh, I've always been close to my family, and just tried to be a really good person. I, I worked in, you know, the best person I could, and I'm not perfect, I'm a sinner, and you know, I, I was really turned off by the Mormon religion, my family being so religious. I There was a lot of things that I really beat myself up about, like having sex before marriage and not being married in the temple and things. I mean, just that I really felt bad about it. I was a huge sinner, you know, and I just... I did, I did, as soon as I moved away from my house, I didn't go to church anymore at all. And um, I worked in the insurance business for a long time, and I took care of a lot of elderly and sick people. And um, I, I just really felt an urge. I just really, my my soul would just not let me leave my office at night until all of my clients had all their medication and and all their claims paid or any problems taken care of. Sometimes they were just lonely and wanted to call and talk, and I would just stay and listen. I just felt that I've just I've, I've always tried to take care of people. Um, and uh, as I got older, I, I was in 2007. I was in a really bad car accident on the freeway. I had a little Ford Mustang, and I had a real big truck hit me from behind. I was at a dead stop in a traffic jam, and someone had come up on the ramp in a big truck with snowmobiles behind them so it was a lot of weight the truck actually ended up before they saw me they tried to skid on their brakes but they were almost up to freeway speed and I saw them coming and I locked up my legs on the clutch and the brake pedal because I saw it just throwing my car forward and killing people I thought I was dead for sure and this truck actually landed up on top of the roof of my car I thought well here here it is I'm gonna die I'm gonna be crushed like a tin can in my car but I somehow made it through that but I was left with some pretty bad injuries um the doctors told me I'd have been better off if it would have broke my back and my neck and I started having really severe headaches that would take my vision out, and I'd get really, I'd just start throwing up. I, I, I'd be stuck on the side of the road a lot of times, just waiting for my vision to come back so that I could make it home. Just they'd come on just so suddenly, and I, it was just really hard to work around those and I was having a lot of pain in my back and my and my left leg which I still live with chronic pain in there all the time and and I just really didn't understand what was happening to me I was spiraling downward big time I was barely keeping my job I wasn't sleeping I wasn't eating I um was moaning in pain all the time. Um, I had slurred speech. I was asking my family to help me. My memory 
my short-term memory had been knocked out. Um, my family just thought I was on drugs because my speech was so slurred. And uh, I was taking um, extra strength, et cetera, and all the time. <laughs> I mean, way too much of it. I had no idea that you could overdose on Tylenol. And I also was prescribed some Lortab that I was taking together, and I was losing track of time. And um, I, I was just trying to keep my job. I so bad, so bad. I was taking way too much medication, but I wasn't. I wasn't realizing I was taking as much as I I was because I wasn't thinking clearly. And. Uh, I ended up having an overdose of Tylenol, and I ended up in the hospital having liver, kidney, and multiple organ failure. And uh, I'll tell you, you've never had pain like that before. And I'm gonna I'm gonna get to the near death experience. I just want to say, you know, before I. I bear my testimony of this that you know I'm I'm very humble person I'm not the same person as I was before and you know I don't tell this out of any kind of oh I'm in some special club or I'm a special person or anything like that it's out of complete humbleness and love and just all glory to God it's not to lord it over anyone and I don't want anyone to feel that way, so I just want to make sure that's clear. You know, and um, Jesus tells us in his own words in John chapter 8, entitled Jesus the Light, you know, our Father is not the God of the dead, but of the living. The dead rises Christ. And you can document that in Jesus' own words in St. John chapter 8. So... He talks about, um, you know, we really have two bodies. We have a physical body, which is a terrestrial, earthly body, and we have a spiritual body, which is a celestial, heavenly body. And so I was in the hospital, and I was just screaming in pain, I mean, I've never felt pain like this. I've, I've never imagined that pain could even get that bad. I thought you would just pass out way before then. And I remember just screaming, swearing uncontrollably, and just crying out, Jesus, help me. Jesus, God, help me. I mean, just screaming it, Jesus, help me. And um, all of a sudden, I started feeling kind of like I was in two places at once, kind of like I was 40% there feeling this pain and screaming and, and, and 60% like in some other place being shielded from it with a lot of love around me. And... And, and I kind of started coming apart a little, and I remember seeing myself from above, watching my body in so much pain, and seeing my family and all the doctors and things in the hospital room. And and I remember being really concerned about my daughter seeing seeing it. And I tried to like shield her. I tried to put white light around her, and I can. I can I can see it to this day. I provided some sort of protection for her, because I can see the light that I threw at her around her to to this day. But after that, I just remember. Uh, I think that they drugged me into a coma. Um, I just remember being just in thick darkness for a long time, and I would try to have a thought. And it would just be too much effort, and I would just slip back into darkness. And then all of a sudden, 
I started seeing really bright symbols before my eyes. I became alert, and in my mind, I was watching these colorful, bright symbols, and they were coming apart and together, and they were teaching me uh, their meanings and and how do you, and how you could use these symbols and that and I just was sitting there watching them for a long time and I remember the star of David real well you know the one with the triangle down and the triangle up um on top of each other and it was teaching me about it, and I I held on to that somehow. I just locked my mind onto it, and I knew that I could use that to travel out of my body, or, and that if I was if I held it strongly, if I was able to hold it, that my body wouldn't die no matter what. So I thought, well. Maybe I'll go check it out, you know, and just, I can, I, as long as I can hold this, you know, I'll be okay, and I'll just go check it out. And then, all of a sudden, I just had a series of symbols flash really fast, like a combination, and it was like a re it was like a release of my spirit from my body. I started to travel out of my body then. And I thought that I I started coming down from my brain, but I actually think that I I came down from my heart. And when I say came down, I all of a sudden was like traveling down a river. And I realized, no, it was the river of my bloodstream. But it seemed like I was outside. All this was happening inside of my body. But it seemed like I was outside on a beautiful river. And I was in kind of an Egyptian-style boat. And it was just like a never-ending river. But I started running into, uh, like, strange scary creatures there was like tests that I had to pass and um, some of them I could just walk through and and they said uh, you know they, they would start their test and then one of them would stop them and say no she holds the star of David and so I didn't have to go through that test I remember there was a test similar to like, um, you know, the Egyptian thing where they show the scales and if your heart's lighter than the feather. There was something similar to that. I can't tell you a lot about the tests um, as I don't remember exactly and, and it's probably not something that I should reveal what I do remember. But um I made it past those tests, and I remember just floating down that river, just being really comfortable and thinking, "Ah, oh, this is great. I'll just, I'll just float down. I'll just float down this river forever." And uh, you know, that was my plan. <laughs> I was just happy with that. And then uh, all of a sudden, something happened, and there was kind of like a spiral portal like a tunnel of light uh, that I've heard other people describe and I, and I'm, all of a sudden I just bam was kicked out of my body and I was all of a sudden in a hospital room with um, lots of doctors and nurses all around and I was like whoa you know at first, I was all of a sudden, you know, with all these doctors and stuff, I was worried I was naked or something. I'd just shown up there. I had no idea what was going on. And I looked down, and I was wearing, like, some beautiful clothes. I remember I had a a shirt that was, like, my favorite shade of pink, 
they were not clothes that I'd ever owned before, but they they were beautiful and like the style of clothes that I would wear. And uh, I was real happy with the clothes. The material, though, was just really different than anything that, that we have here. And uh, I, I saw these doctors around. I didn't recognize that it was me. I looked terrible. My stomach was all blown up. I mean, I... It was huge. I was orange. Um, oh, I looked bad. And uh, but I didn't. I didn't. Rec- I didn't realize it was me at first. I, I was trying to talk to the doctors, you know, and they couldn't hear me or anything. And so I started looking at the person closer, and they were using those shocker paddles on the on on me, on my body, and I saw the heart monitor, the line had, you know, gone, my heartbeat was gone, and they were saying, we're we're losing her, you know, we're going to lose her, she's not going to make it, and, um, and I just kind of, I started realizing, well, I guess that's me, I guess I, I'm dead, you know, and uh, and I just, it was weird. I felt I didn't really feel I felt kind of bad for my body that it was I knew that it was going through so much pain and stuff and I, I felt kind of bad about that, but I didn't really have a a huge connection to it. And when when I had traveled out of my body it was like when I had had to go through those tests it was like I had to let go of of everything in this life, you know, I couldn't hold on to any possessions or the love of my family. I could, I even had to let go of the, the how much I loved my daughter. You know, I couldn't have any kind of hate or anger or anything like that, or it or it held me. It was like a a snare, you know, like for the bird to fly free. You, you couldn't. You can hold on to any of that. And it kind of makes me wonder a little bit about the soul and the difference between the soul and the spirit because it was almost like I kind of had to lay my, myself down so that I could cross. Um, kind of like a bridge. Like I, I, will, lay my, I will lay me down. I, I really literally had to lay me down and, and let go of everything and and to get through those tests. And so after I was in that room and I and I was thinking, well, I guess I'm dead. And uh I just wanted to get out of there. And I went to the hospital door and I tried to open it and my hand just went right through it. And and I started to get a little bit panicked at that point, and I started looking around, and I noticed these two small, well, they were angels, but I didn't know that at the time. I, I thought they were children in the corner of the room. There was two of them looking at me intently, just kind of waiting for me to realize, you know, what was going on. And I knew that they could see me, as no one else was paying any attention to me whatsoever, you know. And I was totally me. I was in my spiritual body. You know, I came right out of my physical body. Uh, but I was totally me. I still had the same thoughts. I still I still looked like me, but much younger. But it was, you know, it was me. And... So I thought these were children over in the corner of the room, and I and I went over to them, and I was going to say to them, um, you kids sh- shouldn't be in here watching this because it was a terrible scene, you know. And I was about to say that to them, and they just looked at me with the most powerful faces, and I just shut my mouth instantly, and I just sat and looked at them intently, and they just exuded power, you know. 
but but they were pretty small. I mean, I'm five foot three, hundred and twenty pound little girl, and they were about half the size of uh, my height. And uh, they they said to me, "Do you want to come with us?" And I said, "Yes." And they instantly got up, and one on each side of me, they put their uh, hands around my arm, one on each side, and we just, poof, right out the roof of the hospital, just right through the walls, just up into the sky. And we were clear up in the sky, and I was looking down at the earth and it was like from an airplane at first and then it was like you could see it for like as a planet and I started to get scared Uh, at first I was just amazed you know watching it and then I started to get scared that I was going to fall you know I was up there really high and um they they said to me you know don't 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 be afraid you're not you won't fall even if we were to let go um you can fly now and i was like i can fly now and i felt my body to see if if i thought that that was you know, you know true and and i could tell my body was different and and that i could fly now and I, so i was like okay yeah i can fly now so i wasn't scared anymore and um, I was talking to the two angels, and and it, it occurred to me, uh, where are you taking me? You know, and they said to me, the great king is waiting for you. And I thought to myself, the great king is waiting for me. At, at this point in my life, I'd considered myself an atheist and. I'd gone through so much hardship and stuff, I was just mad at everyone, you know, and I'd had a really hard time, just a a lot of bad things. And I had no belief whatsoever, so I was like, the great king is waiting for me, and I was picturing in my head like some, I was going to be part of some harem or something, you know. I was like, I have no idea who that is. I haven't. I didn't think this through too well, and um, I thought. I thought to myself, "Oh shit! The great king is waiting for me." And the angels started laughing, and it was that point that I realized that they could read my mind, and so I started to engage in telepathy with them from that point on, and, instead of speaking with our mouths, you know. And um, we, they took me to, I don't know, a a different dimension, another planet. It seemed like another planet. Uh, I'm sure I was in a different dimension. Um, And when I could, when we were almost there, I, I just could start smelling the most lovely fragrance. I just, it's unexplainable. It was just the most beautiful fragrance that I've ever smelled. It was just saturated the air, and it was just so beautiful. And I could hear the most beautiful music. And I was so interested and seeing where that was coming from. And the angels, they flew me in, and it was just the most beautiful place, just like big gardens all over, and just the most beautiful flowers. And, like, the music was coming from the flowers and the plants, just from everywhere. Just everything was so alive and so colorful. There was more colors than we have here. It was just magnificent. And there were people lined up on on each side, and, and they brought me in in the middle and set me down. And these it was like I was on parade. It was like a parade, but I was the the parade, you know. 
and these people were communicating with me telepathically all at once, but but like there wasn't any confusion. Each one was completely separate. My mind was just able to handle each different one of them. Like I could instantly pick up on, I knew that their their lives and they were telling me, you know, have no fear, it's going to be okay, don't be scared, we love you so much. They're just beaming love at me. And like at this point, you know, my whole family had had just abandoned me. I, I didn't know what was going on with me. I didn't realize I was living in chronic pain. I had just gone through so much. And I thought I just thought I'd been left, and that no one even cared about me. And I just I just fell on the ground, and I just started sobbing. I mean, the love was just so overwhelming, and I just couldn't believe that all these people loved me so much, and they were here for me, and they were so excited to see me. And it was like I realized I'm home. Like I felt such a great feeling of homecoming. And I was just on the ground sobbing. And then there was uh, this huge angel that came. And I mean huge, you know, like way more than 10 feet tall. Just huge in the air dressed in beautiful robes and just exquisite clothing. And um, there were some other angels that were huge too, but not as big as this one, that, that were playing musical instruments and stuff that came with him. And, and I remember looking at these and being scared. I was scared of them. They were so huge. They were just massive. I was like an ant in, in comparison to them. And uh, the, the biggest one, he, sp- they, they, these big ones, they spoke in a language of music. And um, this big one, he called me by my real name, which is not Sherry. <laughs> He he called my real name, and it was like all remembrance started coming back to me in huge waves. Like I remembered everything. I knew how the universe worked. I I knew the plan. I I knew what had happened. I knew where I was. I knew who all these people were. I knew who that huge angel was. I knew him well. I'd known him forever, for ancient. I mean, I realized I was an ancient being, and and these were ancient beings, and I'd known them for way longer than anyone, you know, anyone that, it's not even comparable to like the person that you would know the very best in this life is not even like a a day of knowing in, in comparison to knowing, you know, these, just, I knew them well. And I ran and jumped, and I just ran and jumped into his arms. I was so happy to see him. And I was so excited. I started talking and I was so, so surprised to hear myself start. I was talking in the same language of music as they spoke to me in. And I was kind of shocked when I heard it come out of of me. And um, I was just so happy to see him. I just didn't, I didn't want to let go hugging him. But uh, off in the distance... Uh, I I saw the great king (laughs) standing on the clouds, just like it says in the Bible. And it was Jesus, and he was a, a huge being too. And just the light 
coming off of him. I mean, it provided all the light for this place. And it it was greater than like 10,000 suns. It was so bright. I mean, I, I thought to myself, if if I had been in my physical body, I would just instantly be ashes, you know. I would just... I wouldn't even be able to withstand that light for even a second. I would become just ash in not even one second. It was so bright and so glorious. And the two little angels, they came and got me, one on each side again, and they flew me up there, and they set me down on my feet in front of him. And I tried to stand, and I was instantly thrown, just, I mean, my body just crumpled. I was just thrown at his feet, just face down. And and I was looking at his feet, and I could see the actual holes in his feet, to, to his wounds from where he was crucified. And, and I thought, I'm at the feet of Jesus. You know, I'm really at the feet of Jesus. And I just started shaking all over and trembling. I, I, I was pretty fearful. I was thinking, oh, man, I haven't been the greatest person. What is he going to think of me? And he just, I just started being hit with just oceans I mean, oceans of love, tons of love, just huge waves of the purest, most unconditional love were washing over me. And I was just crying uncontrollably. It's hard for me to even tell about this part without crying because it was so wonderful. Like, we are so loved. If you even knew, you would just break down bawling. It, we are so loved and cared for. And I was so happy to be there. And he said to me, you know, fear not. Speak freely. And it took me a while to stop shaking and stuff enough to... to just even rise to my knees and, and look at him and you know and I could tell it was Jesus he was just like a white shining being it was hard to even make out that he had a form but he could tone the light down I learned later and he could also make himself smaller and stuff like normal size but he appeared in all his glory at first and and I said, Lord, am I going to hell then? <laughs> that was the first thing that I said to Jesus. You know, I, f I feel so bad about that now. I just wish I would have said, I love you so much. You know, I just, I was kind of mad at, with God if I believed in one at that time. And I, And I was just thinking of, you know, I haven't been the greatest person. And, and the first thing I said was, Lord, am I going to hell then? And and he said, for what? He, he said, for, for what? Like, he couldn't imagine anything that I had done that he would send me to hell for. But he didn't deny there was a hell, you know. And I just started spilling my guts um, for doing drugs. I probably killed myself overdosing on drugs. I'm probably a suicide here. You know, I don't, I don't know if it was an accidental thing or if, or if it just became too much. And, and I had intentionally tried to take my life. I kind of feel that probably is the case. And, uh, I just started spilling my guts just for have, just for doing this, for doing that, for 
you know, just everything. Just told them everything. And I was thinking to myself at one time, shut up. (laughs) But I couldn't. He just, just pulled it out of you. And, um... I've got to try to find my other phone here real fast. Sorry, I can hear this one beep, and I'm afraid it's going to lose battery. But uh, I could hear him. I, I, I just started spilling my guts. And he started comforting me over uh, over things that I had done like the taking drugs part he's he started showing me how I had been living in chronic pain for years he was showing me how I had uh okay let me get on this other phone he started showing me how like different ways that I'd been sitting to take pressure off my back and leg and things and how I hadn't been eating or sleeping, things that I just really wasn't aware of that I was even doing, how I was acting so strangely and things. And he actually showed me like inside my body, it was kind of like a hologram thing where we could go inside my body and he was showing me the actual injuries and stuff and and uh things that were wrong and he he told me anyone would have taken drugs you've been living in a lot of pain and it really comforted me because my family had really accused me hard of being a drug addict so i was like they had me convinced I was a drug addict, you know. And I really hadn't, I wasn't trying to be a drug addict. I was just trying to be normal enough to keep my job and things. I was trying to hold on to my life. Um, but it was just, you know, chronic pains are a real insidious thing. It's real hard to describe if you don't have it. But uh, it, then it started into like a life review. And it was kind of like a movie of your life being shown before you. And er- every memory, every bit of your life, things that you'd forgotten, just played out in front of me. And um, he'd stop it at certain parts and say things to me or... And, like, it took him a long time to straighten out my thinking from what I learned as a Mormon. Um, We spent a lot of time talking about that. And uh, he was really angry over, you know, one thing that really angers him is people that mislead other people. Like, he wasn't happy with Joseph Smith at all. And that is one thing he's really mad about. He doesn't like it when his word is used and his name is used and misused to um, for other people's gain or it's twisted you know, or it's they they take one part of it, they use it as a weapon, um, and, and like he's not happy with people who claim to be be you know you have to pay to get this knowledge and stuff. Um, it, it's it's free to everyone. There's no one that has the hookup. We all have the hookup. Um, when he was crucified and resurrected, you know, his Holy Spirit, he became accessible to all of us. You know, it's all inside of us. And he wants us to choose him. He wants a relationship with us. 
and he loves us so much and I was just so happy to be there and and I got to spend so much time with him I, f- I figured out from hospital and insurance records that I was actually out of my body for 11 days it, it seemed like this whole thing happened within maybe a couple hours the time is is just different it's kind of like time really doesn't exist there but I got to go into the city. This, this, I was in the kingdom of God, and and this, this place is like on a on a big mountain. There's a big city there, and there and there's an ocean around it. I don't I don't think it's an island though. It's kind of more like a peninsula, but there's a big mountain, and there's a huge city there, and there really is huge gates covered with pearls and gold and the streets seem to be gold but there there things were built out of materials that I couldn't identify but there was a lot of uh buildings with jewels you know just like big line like the the first part of the building would be all sapphires in a line, and then there'd be a big row of rubies, and then sardis, and garnet, and topaz, and just all these precious gems and and materials that I just, we have nothing like it here that I could even compare it to. And I got to go inside the city with Jesus, and I got to spend a lot of time with him, and it was like he was showing me off to all the people. And I was so happy to be there. I was home, and and all the people were so wonderful. Like, they just loved me so much. They, just, they tried to follow us around. They just wanted to be near and they'd run up to me and give me gifts, <laughs> and their gifts were so amazing. It was like they completely studied your personality and just they made things just totally that fit you perfectly. And 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 then they were just delighted, like they were they would go to each other did you see did you see she loved my gift she loved my and, and they would just brag to each other and it was they were just so awesome and jesus would just laugh and we just had such a great time and i just remember talking to him about so many things and we were just so close and it, Jesus was cool. I mean, he was really cool. Like he had a sense of humor. He cracked jokes. You just felt so comfortable with him. And it was just I was just so happy to be home and so happy to be there and the the city was just beautiful. Like there was fountains everywhere filled with just big pools of water and waterfalls and fish in them and seahorses and beautiful birds and flowers and gardens everywhere, beautiful buildings, arches, beautiful gateways. Um, there was like a a library of of knowledge where you could go to and look up like anything in history and and there was a big temple that was the home of Jesus and I got to see inside of it and he he said would you like to come and live here with me and I was like yes I couldn't even believe he would consider me for that. You know, I was like, oh, would I? Because the the best thing was you just wanted to be close to Jesus. Like, just being close to him was just the best thing ever. I just can't even describe it. So it just 
so much joy, peace, forgiveness, grace, mercy, understanding, just, he just radiated love and just, it it was just magnificent to be in his presence and you just wanted to be close to him. You just wanted to hug him and just be in his arms all the time. But there was many, many mansions there and and the people they they lived the way they lived was so awesome. Nobody needed money. Everybody just had everything they needed, like one person had a talent for making shoes, and one person had a gift for um, music. So the person that made shoes would uh, make shoes for the music per- person who could play music, and they'd they'd play a song for payment, and and no- nothing was better than the other one. It was all considered just extremely you know, great, Uh, no occupation or anything was above another, it was all just equal, and and they just loved each other so much, and they had boats that they could go out on fishing and things, it it was kind of, it was surprising how much it really was similar to here it was similar to the to this earth but but way more beautiful way m- more colors there was always singing there was and this beautiful scent everywhere and uh he he finally said to me do you want to stay here or do you want to go back and and I was like, oh, I want to stay, you know. I wa- yeah, I want to stay for sure. And he was like, well, before you make your decision, there there's something then that I need to show you. And I was thinking, oh, there's nothing that you could possibly show me that I w- would go back for. There's just there's just nothing. I'm I'm staying. I was thinking that, you know, there's just nothing you could show me. It's like, well. Before you make up your mind, um, well, let me back up a minute. When I was with Jesus, there's one part that I need to tell you. We had a real, spe- there was a real special like ceremony one night, and 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 me and Jesus were alone, and he walked into my body. And it was just, it was like he he became part of me. And and when he walked into my body, it was like our souls melted together. And it was just like, it felt like just the hugest, just like 20 million body orgasms at once. I mean, it was just... I remember thinking if I was in a human body, I would just explode. Like I couldn't handle this feeling. It would be too much. I mean, it was almost too much to handle then. And it just lasted for so long. And I knew I knew that he was part of me and that he was in me then. And... Uh, so now we come back to the part where he says to me if I wanted to stay or go and that there was something that he had to show me before I made my decision. And he he showed me that my dad was very, very ill, um, had a very rare illness, and at this time, we did not know that my dad was ill. I mean, we had no idea that he was sick. And so this would be nothing that, that I would think that or anything. And this actually turned out to happen exactly as Jesus showed me after I came back two years later after this near-death experience. My dad 
was diagnosed with something called Shy Draeger's, which is a really rare, horrific disease. And Jesus showed me how hard it would be for my mom, and it really would emotionally break her. She she would have, you know, without me there, he showed me what it would be like for my mom and dad without me there to help. And uh, my mom would have ended up in the mental hospital. And uh, I, I just couldn't take that, you know. And... And also, I, I I developed such a love. Like when Jesus came into me, my heart, I actually felt my, felt my heart just melt. Like when it says in the Bible, All right, praise God, folks. Uh, her line just got disconnected. I hope she realizes that she got disconnected and she calls back. Um, if my nose sounds like it's stuffed up, it's because I've been crying and laughing so hard I can barely uh, breathe. Um, I'm going to try to call her on my cell phone and see if I can get her to realize that she got disconnected. Um, uh, praise God. Hopefully she'll just call right back. But let me just see if I can. Of course, you've got to have security on your phone so you got to log in like 50 ways this Sunday. <laughs> praise Jesus. All right. Hallelujah. Okay, so anyway, let me go ahead and see. Uh, praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm still getting used to my new phone, folks. Praise God. All right, so let me go see if I can dial this. All right, praise God. Uh, or maybe it was the Holy Spirit not wanting her to share that extra special uh, mystery with us. 81. All right, hallelujah. Uh, and let me see if I can call her. And get her attention, uh, just in case she doesn't realize that she disconnected. Praise Jesus. All right, let's see if this connects through. Uh, all right, nope, it didn't go through. All right, praise God. All right, so, um, well, I don't know what happened other than the normal technological assumptions, which would be things like the battery ran out on both phones and both phones were wireless. And now <laughs> she's probably going, oh, no, what am I going to do now? Uh, praise Jesus. So, uh oh, wait, wait, there we go. Uh, it looks like she did call back in. Praise the Lord. Uh, let me go ahead and click right over to her. Are you there? Oh, Johnny, I'm sorry. Yes, I am. Where did you where did I get cut off at? I apologize. You were talking about that your heart became so big after Jesus had walked inside of you that it changed you, it, you know, that you looked at things differently. You were talking about how your mom would have been in a mental institution. It okay. was all about the decision about coming back down to the earth and all that and how your oh, heart, just, uh, you know, kind of. Kind of like, you know, the, in, in the, in the mm -hmm. Christmas story, the Christmas stole Christmas when he, when he felt the love, you know, his heart got, yeah. you know, 10 times bigger. <laughs> you know, okay, kind of like, good. I'm uh, like, uh, I was thinking, uh, how long have I been talking to myself? <laughs> no, 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 not long at all. And, um, and, uh, okay. uh, I've been just sitting here crying and laughing and crying and laughing and crying so hard. I was like, I was afraid you were going to say, Hey, John, are you there? And I'd be like, tears rolling down my face. <laughs> <laughs> stuck in my nose. <laughs> I know. I, mean, I know. It, it, it is very emotional. It's oh, a I, hard I, thing I, to talk about. And, it, I've been taking notes on every single thing. Now, the part about Jesus walking walking into you is new for me, but the. Mm -hmm. um, Feeling, you know, that the way that you describe the feeling, the ecstasy of the moment and the magnitude of the ecstasy is something I've heard of before. Mm -hmm. uh, really? I, I did not hear. I've never heard of anybody explain. Uh, uh, I have heard people say that Jesus was a preacher, uh, not, not, not just a rabbi and a cool, calm, collected teacher, but he was a preacher. He would stand up on the rocks and he would say, you know, verily I say to you, you know, he was a preacher. I mm -hmm. heard also uh, uh, Jesse Duplantis, when he was taken to heaven, he did like you did. He started to confess of things before Jesus, and Jesus just put his hand on his shoulders and said, forget about it. Let's forget about it. Yeah, forget yeah. About it. A, you know, which, a lot which, of the things. Bible, you know? 
it, it's it's exactly what the Bible says. It says if we confess yeah. of our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But one thing after another, the library of knowledge, uh, that, that that's very yeah. similar to some of the things that Kat Kerr had seen when she was there, um, wow. the, the way that people were coming up. Uh, but the, but the whole thing is that Jesus, when you said Jesus was so cool and he was cracking jokes, I just, I lost it. I lost it. <laughs> I just started the ball because I knew it. I knew he, he was. He is. I he had he a was. good I sense of I humor. I, I couldn't it. believe I how cool he was. There's and he so was so many. handsome. There's and so he, many. he was cool. There's so many things that you said that I knew in my spirit. I've known them for years, but I've waited yep. and waited for somebody to confirm it for me. I just knew it. And then you were saying, <laughs> and then I was sitting there crying and crying and crying because, and that whole I thing know. about him walking inside of you and the overwhelming ecstasy. I have shared yeah. this, uh, Reverend, Reverend Odin Hetrick. Uh, he, you know, of course he tried to keep, you know, it's very difficult for people to explain yeah. things because if they explain them in the most raw colloquialisms of today, then the devil will use it against you to make it a dirty thing. And so people yeah. will get in their minds. It they wasn't will think, oh, dirty was, at no, all, no, 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 but it did feel like a sec- similar to a sexual yeah, yeah. orgasm yeah. of your entire body, like times 200 well, million. <laughs> Here's the thing that's amazing. So Odin Hetrick, who's, who was taken to, to heaven, we, we got a full 35 minutes left, but Odin Hetrick, okay. who was taken to heaven, uh, he was shown, and this was one of the more controversial things he was shown. Many things that he saw were controversial, but, um, mm-hmm. but, but they aligned perfectly with the stuff that you were saying. Uh, and and he, one of the things that he was shown was that uh, Jesus would um now this isn't the punchline this is just the introduction to the punchline but that 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 we would eventually be given the opportunity to accept what uh is referred to as a covenant companion and that that covenant companion would be more glorious and amazing a custom created eternal companion that was everything that we would ever want in our wildest imaginations and our best possible dreams. Yeah, and, yeah. But here's the part. Here's the part that I wanted to get to. The part that I wanted to get to was uh, now Odin, when he was given testimony, and this is like 30 years ago, I guess, or whatever, that he's given this uh-huh. testimony. Very, very careful choosing his words because, you know, nowadays you can say certain things and people won't go, huh, and fall off the back of their chair. Uh, but, right. Uh, but he was given his testimony. If he had said some of those things using today's lingo, uh, people yeah. would have been, he would have, you know, rejected yeah. it immediately. And he, he right. the way he put it was, he said, when you are with your covenant companion, it makes what God has given between a man and a woman seem like your worst nightmare. That's the way he put it. And, it um, really and it's, is. Fascinating. it's fascinating because check this out. So I had somebody ask me one time, because, you know, a lot of people are like, well, that's of the devil. You know, don't look at that science fiction movie. Don't watch that because that's of the devil. Cause, and I don't look at it like that. I see the fingerprint of God on everything, you know. So I always wonder yeah. to myself, could there be some – supernatural spiritual godly truth behind that uh and 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 so what so i so here's what i imagine what odin hetrick was describing might be like there's a movie because remember that jesus said not one sparrow falls to the ground outside of the father's will which means that mm-hmm. everything is ultimately the will of the father but of course the devil if given the opportunity can hijack it and pollute it amen okay yeah. now said though there's a that means there's under underpinnings of godly truth behind everything that we see because it's all ultimately the father's first and i watched this yes. movie years ago called uh it was called uh, a cocoon and in the movie cocoon there was this you know otherworldly being it was a pretty lady and her name was yeah. kitty they called her kitty uh-huh. and Gutenberg uh, was 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 hanging out with her in a pool, in a swimming pool, and they and she said, "Would you like to know what it's like to uh, for me to share myself with you?" And 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 she and and he said, "Well, uh, oh, uh, okay. This is a, <laughs> no, this I kind of like remember rate, that. This is like a rated G PG thirteen kind of yeah. movie, you know." So, 
So it had to be clean. And 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 Gutenberg is like, uh, okay. And all of a sudden, this 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 light came out of her body, swirled around in the air, gathering more and more and more power as it swirled yeah. to the left and to the right of the swimming pool and went down and hit Gutenberg, boom, right on his chest. And he flew back and he was like, whoa. And it was like, it was the <laughs> best scene ever. And I was like, and I tell people, I said, you know what? I think that when you're with your covenant companion in heaven, that that is the kind of experience we're talking about, that it is so beyond yeah. what and utter with our it, it pathetic was just like a complete reveling in each other i mean you just it was just you were just reveling in each other I, but it was so holy and clean but it was right, right. it was also just so marvelous like you could never be that close to one you just wanted to be closer your souls were just, spirits were just totally together, and it's really hard to explain. Now, I've had it people wasn't think, dirty at all. It was no, the most course, magnificent no. thing that's ever happened to me. It's like, my, I mean, it's my greatest treasure. I wouldn't trade See, people, this for anything. People. Amen. People, here's the thing. The reason why this, you know, while, while, high, while in, by today's corrupted standards, while highly controversial, your, your testimony, uh, particularly in regard to that experience, to me, it's revolutionary. To me, it is, in, it is absolutely 1,000% believable and tangible, and I know, that it, I know that I know that it is absolutely part of the experience. Because here's the thing. I, I, people have said things to me over the many years that I've been blessed to be in ministry and such. And I, and, and because I have specialized in concepts associated with other outside of planet earth, things away from planet earth, things that are extra, I, I don't, you know, extraterrestrial of course is a polluted de demonic thing. Oh, it's the gray aliens and everything. No, 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 no. And when I'm referring to those things, I'm talking about what we see in the Hubble space telescope, what we see that is all part of the artwork and the beauty of God's uh, infinite creation and the glory right. of it. So when I see those things, when I'm, you know, because I have specialized in those areas, I have had the blessing of many people who have been, uh, you know, have gone through negative events associated with the mm -hmm. fallen angel. But nevertheless, uh, because of that, I've gotten to hear testimonies from people and things from people that would never make it into the podcasting world, they would never make it on the radio shows typically. And, um, yeah. and, and I, I've had people say things like to me, like, you know, that they were not happy about the idea of having to go to heaven because they would read the scriptures associated with, well, uh, oh, well, you know, uh, we, we don't, you know, procreate or whatever in heaven. And so, it, you know, in their earthly eyes, they yeah. perceive that experience as being the only reason why they live. And so they're willing to, 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 to swim in the filth and the cesspool of sin and adultery and sickness, yeah. even though we're warned not to have anything to do with it, to walk away from it, to reject it, to shun it. Uh, indeed, where even Jesus even mentions a, a, about ultimately the merits in the scripture about, you know, uh, being a eunuch. Of course, it's highly mysterious verses in the scripture. The Apostle Paul says, uh, yeah. I, you know, if you want to serve God, I recommend that you don't even get married. He come right out and said, I recommend you don't even get married. Uh, then you've got references to the concept of being a virgin, metaphorical references. Uh, yeah. You've got uh, in Revelation, in, in, in Matthew 25, that, that whole concept. I, and then because and so people would be like, hey, you know, they would look, think negatively about going to heaven. They would think they would embrace yeah. uh, sin because it was all they had to look forward to. And it's so sad to realize that 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 what we have in our yeah. eternal existence so far exceeds. Our wildest so far. Well, that and we even even know. now. You know, I get flashes of that. Like Jesus is inside me now, and and I feel that at times, and it feels like that. I mean, and it, it feels orgasmic, and like, and it, it's not even comparable to sex we have here. 
Um, right, and you're using that term, folks. I'm just here to, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to play. The, I'm going to play yeah, the. Yeah, I'm not uh, saying. But I, no, I, no, no. I'm just going to say. I don't even know what word morning. to describe it. Yeah. Correct. That's what I was going to say. I was going to simply say that the choice of words that Sister Sherry is using is because there are not other words to describe it. It's yeah. Simple. There are yeah, no exactly. other words on the earth. You can open up your thesaurus all you want. You can flip through 700,000 words if you wish, and you will not be able to find a word that even begins to touch on it. Uh, and exactly. so, uh, yes, yeah, amen. So, you know, we'll put, a, yeah. we'll put a little disclaimer. Although nowadays with the television the way it is, you can't watch, uh, you know, even a sci-fi TV show without endless commercials about this drug and that drug and yeah. men's disorders and women's disorders. And we live in such a sick, twisted society in the context of your use of the term is so wonderful and glorious to imagine. Yeah, no, this was just yeah. so beautiful. If we only got like 35 minutes left, I better tell you the rest of it because there's yeah. still more. Yep. Okay. So should I continue? Absolutely. Okay, so he he'd asked me if I wanted to stay or go, and he'd shown me, you know, how how bad it would be for my mom and my dad, and uh, and I was like, okay, you know, that's enough. I was just bawling, you know. I couldn't, I could not leave my mom and dad like that, and 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 also, I was shown what's going to happen here. And and I don't remember, you know, so I I can't tell you, but I was sh- I was shown the memory of that's been taken away, but I was shown what was gonna happen here, and I have had developed such a love for all my brothers and sisters. I mean, we're so connected. We're all brothers and sisters, and we are way more connected than you even have any idea. And, you know, I knew people needed me. You know, maybe I could if I could even help one person. I mean, I would miss anyone that didn't make it home so much. You know, it would be like having an arm cut off or something way worse than even... I'd rather give an arm than lose one of you beloved people. I I, I love you. And so I, you know, Jesus was like, you know, you have a great testimony and, and I'll let you remember and... um and I would ask you if if you would bear witness of this for me, um, to me, and, and to my kingdom. And uh, and I was like, yeah, of course, you know, I'll do, I'll help, I'll help, you know, I'll I'll I will, I'll help. And and then he told me. You know, um, your body is severely hurt. I mean, you are damaged. Um, But I'm going to heal. I'm going to heal it for you. I mean, you're going to be in no worse shape. And you're just you're still going to have the pain from the auto accident. I mean, you're going to live in chronic pain for the rest of your life. And and I was like, well, you know, that's fine. I'll, 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 I'm willing. You know, it just, it just, this life is so short. I was like, I'll, I'll be willing to live in pain the rest of it. It's, I'll do it. I, I need to go for my family, and and I need to convince them um, to come to to have a relationship with Jesus and and for them to find him and and anyone else that I can because you're all my family. And I have such a great love for you. And so um, I agreed to come back. And after I agreed to come back, I wasn't allowed inside the city anymore. And I, and I didn't see Jesus for a little while anymore. I, I went. I had to go to this place that I called the waiting place. 
it was still inside the kingdom of God, but it was like outside the gates of the city. I wasn't allowed in the city part anymore, but I was kind of like down by the seashore, kind of up still on the hill, but I could more down by the sea, and it was kind of like an outdoor market type place, and there were restaurants you could eat, but you didn't have to eat, but you could eat if you wanted to for pleasure. You, you didn't have to breathe, but you, but you could breathe if you felt more comfortable breathing, again, for, like, pleasure. And I didn't want any food, and and there was even a, a place that you could go and, and they braided your hair, they call it plating or something, they did your hair all elaborately and they they were beckoning me to come have my hair done and and I was like, no. And now that I look back at it, I kind of think maybe because I was being watched there and I kind of think maybe I was being tested there to see if I was still interested in like earthly things or like my looks or you know, am I tempted by food, things like that. I I didn't want to do anything. But I just sat there, and I just wanted to look at all the other beautiful people. There was a lot of other people there from all kinds of different countries, you know, wearing all their their traditional clothing and stuff. You know, everyone was dressed in beautiful clothing but you know you could tell the different styles of the country and stuff and I just you know wanted to sit there and just enjoy the people and I did and it started being quite quite a long time and I started thinking well maybe my body's not going to pull through you know maybe maybe I'm 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 just really dead maybe it's beyond help and I thought to myself, well, dang, I died before I got to go to Africa on safari because that's one thing that I've always wanted to do. So I've always wanted to go to Africa on safari to see the animals. And the second I thought it, I all of a sudden was in Africa in this Jeep with this wild <laughs> guy who was completely funny and awesome and he I was on safari and he was taking me around and showing me all the animals but I was completely connected into like the plants I could hear their thoughts uh, of all living things I mean all the animals I, I I could hear what they were thinking I could talk to them I remember I I thought the giraffes were really cool. They had a really funny way of thinking, and I thought they were really funny. And um, it was a great time. I had an awesome African safari. And then the second that I started thinking, I wish, why did I do this? I wish I was back in that other place now. And then, uh, bam, all of a sudden I was back there sitting at the table right outside the gates and um i slowly started feeling like you know how they talk about the silver cord i could slowly start feeling like a little thread of contact with my body just like the slightest connection through this silver just thin gossamer thread i could feel I, I could I could sense my body through this my physical body, and I was starting to sense that. And <clears throat> there had been this gate that that went down lower on the beach that I had been longing to go through, and I hadn't been allowed to um, yet. And I knew that there was something. Uh, behind that gate and and down there on the beach that I desperately wanted. And once I started feeling this connection back to my physical body, the two little angels came back. And I was like, oh, I'm happy to see you guys. Where'd you go? Because I hadn't seen them the whole time uh, up until now. 
and uh, they just smiled. They're really business-like. You know, it was a miracle I made them laugh. I mean, they're real business <laughs> and kind of they're real warrior. They're real warriors. I learned, and um, they finally let me go through this gate. They they took me through the gate that I'd been longing to go through, and. They took me, we went down this little path, and down there was all of my family members, all of my family members, tons of them, more than, I mean, I didn't even think I had that many family members, just, and and I knew each one of them, you know, all, all the dead family members, all the ones from the past generations, um, kids who hadn't been born yet. There, there was my one little nephew who was about to be born, and I remember having a conversation with him, and he was like all nervous and scared to be going to Earth, and I, and I told him, well, I'm going back too, and I'll be there. You'll be born right into my family. Remember me, and I'll take care of you. Don't worry. And and he re- he recognized me. That little baby jumped right in my arms, and he wouldn't go to anyone um, after I got back. But I, I saw um, my uncle who had been murdered, and, and he asked me to give a message to his son. Um, and... Uh, I, I only had a short period of time with like each family member, and each one was real considerate of the others not to take up any time. And my my grandma, <laughs> she kept kind of buttoning in, and because she, she she kept telling me something, don't forget over and over again, don't forget. And it is only recently that I remembered what she told me not to forget, and she told me not to forget who I am and um, there was one family member all these family members were dressed in white robes I knew that they lived there in the kingdom of God they were shining and glorious everyone was young you know I realized after a while that you could kind of change your appearance you know like I said Jesus could make himself like bigger and and the people you there were some that had silver hair, but everyone else was really young, so I was kind of questioning that. But even though they had silver hair, they were, they still looked really young, but they just liked to appear that way. You could kind of change yourself in to how you wanted to appear. You could change your appearance, you know. And... uh there was one family member, my grandpa, from my dad's side, who I, I had had hard feelings for my whole life. He had left my dad and my grandma and um, my dad's sister and brother when they were very young. And um, my family had been very wealthy. My great-great-grandfather had owned this huge planing mill, Welch's planing mill. Um, They owned all of Midville, a city called Midville here in Utah, in Salt Lake City. It's a part of it now. But he made this huge company for, and he worked very, very hard. He built it from scratch, and he meant for it to be a way for all of his posterity to have a way to make it through this life and my grandpa had totally squandered all the money and had just just ruined it and and I and but mostly I had I had hard feelings about the way that he had treated my dad and I had only met him a couple times in my life he was real stuck up. He he had just he had a huge museum in his house of this huge gun collection. Uh, one time I met him, he was on a fabulous yacht. I mean, he was a drunkard. He just 
so I had some hard feelings for him, and, and and the two little angels they they came and asked me if if I wanted to see my grandpa. Like they need they they wanted my permission, and and I said yes. You know I want to see him, and they they brought him from somewhere else, and he looked terrible. I mean, he wasn't dressed in the nice clothes. He, he he looked horrible, and he just fell at my feet like I had Jesus's, and he just started spilling his guts, like started just saying, you know, I, I did this to you, I did this to you, I did this, I did, you know. Um, you, I could have saved you from this or that, but I could have made your life so much easier. I wasted all the money on nothing. I did. He just started just spilling his guts, and and I just kept saying, I just kept holding my arms out to him, and because I wanted him just to just come and hug me, and I just kept saying, I forgive you, you know. And he just kept spilling it, and I finally got down on my knees next to him and and I took him by the shoulders and I looked at, at him right you know and, and I lifted up his face and I made him look right in my eyes and I said I forgive you and I love you and I want you to let go of this I want you to be here I expect you to be here when I get back we have a lot of time to make up for and like just the most happy, grateful, relieved expression just came over him. He just started bawling and just fell on my shoulder, and we just hugged and we're crying. He was so grateful for my forgiveness. It meant so much to him. And, like, I mean, how could I not forgive him after Jesus had just forgiven me? But besides that, I wanted to forgive him. And it was just, you know, I didn't, I saw how wretched and and how much he beat himself up about and just how miserable he was and how it haunted him. And just, and I did not want that for him. And I love him. And I hope that he has let that go. And after that, it was time for me to to go. And the two angels came and got me, and I, I said goodbye to my family. And it was my grandma telling me, don't forget, don't forget. <laughs> and I forgot until just recently I remembered. I was woke up in the night, and I was like, I remember, Grandma, don't forget who I am. Uh, and... Uh, so the angels, they took me, and we were coming back to the earth. And on our way back, when we got close to the earth, was it's kind of like everything is in layers. They call them realms. You can call them dimensions. Um, they, the people in the kingdom of God, they, they call them realms. So when we got came back close to Earth, there was this realm or like little, like layer um, that was right, real close to our reality. I mean, it's literally like right here. It was just we had we had to pass through it to get to get back here, and um, it was. We just we entered this gray, dingy void of of all hope. Just the worst, smelly. Oh, the smell! And I knew I was being shielded from all this. Like two hundred million, it was two hundred million times worse than what I was being exposed to. I knew that I was being shielded from it greatly, but the smell was just too much. And and the feeling there, it was just horrific. 
and it was just gray, no color, just hopeless, and just kind of smoky, like you could barely kind of see, and I knew that the angels wanted to just rip right through there. They want to just pass on through there as quick as possible. You know, I could feel their, you know, they they were just set on getting through there as quick as they as as we could. And the second we entered there, uh, I just started getting mobbed. I mean, just all of these. <sighs> Well, they were humans, but they were like mangled humans, like missing skin, body parts, moaning, screaming, dragging their legs, trying to get to me. Um, just scary. Like I, I, I wouldn't. Even, I, I knew that they were human, but and and, and I paused. Because I knew they were human and, and they were begging me for help. And I tried to question the angels about, you know, all these questions arose. What are, what are these doing here? Who are these? And the angels, they usually, these two angels, they usually would answer anything I asked them. They would not say anything about them. Um, they just told me, do not think on these things. And they would not say anything else about them. And they just wanted, they're like, okay, let's go. And, and But I paused because I was like wondering if I could help them. And I was, and I was like, w- how are these, you know, why, what are, what are they doing here? And I was reaching out telepathically. I mean, I can't tell you that I know this for sure. It's just what I picked up on, like, through the telepathic um, powers that I had in this spiritual body, that in my spiritual body. And I picked up on that uh, some of them were there because... uh, uh, they wouldn't let go of hate, or, or they 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 had anger, or they had possessions. They didn't want to leave, or um, some wanted revenge. Um, these were just some of the things that I picked up on real quick, and and then I saw the owners of these humans <laughs> coming for them. The, the wow. angels told me, you know, do not fear. They can't touch you. They were swarming me, but they they couldn't t- actually touch me. They t- they told me they are attracted to your light. And um, then I saw the owners of these things coming for them, and these were not human at all, and they were very. <laughs> Scary. I've never seen anything move like that before. And I was scared to death. And the angels were were like, I could feel that they were getting ready to fight for me if they had to. They were getting ready to fight. And they were trying to, to tell me, let's go. And they were getting ready to fight. And I was like, yeah, let's go. And we were out of there. Wow, praise and, God. We're down yeah. to the, the one minute mark. This is amazing. So what happened when you got finally back to Earth? Do you remember the the event of actually coming back into your body? Do you remember that part? Yeah, I remember it because it was shatteringly painful. We finally got back into the hospital room and they and I saw my body there and I was just bruised from head to toe just looked horrible. They told me, go and line yourself up with your body. And I did. And um, just the most horrific pain, just uh, an inhuman scream just started coming out of me. And I instantly tried to jump right back out, but I was held in my body. Right. 
Wow. And so in yeah. closing, we're down to 15 seconds, but we'll run over a little bit over into overtime. Okay. Uh, so, so how, how do you feel? I mean, right now that I know, I know, I know I'm not talking about whether you have pain or not or any of that, but I mean, right. do you feel, that the mission, that all of these things are worthwhile, that the net result of this entire experience and the things that you're going to have to go through on this earth are all ultimately going to be worth it? Yes. I was shown everything that was going to happen to me, and I agreed to it. And I knew that it was going to be a lot of suffering in that, but um, I I knew that it was important for me to be here and and. I hope that I have no idea why Jesus would choose me to bear witness. I'm totally shy, and this is a hard thing to talk about, and I know I'll get a lot of ridicule, and people think I'm insane, but the love that I have in my heart for others, and that just it just overcomes everything. And, and looking and, back on the things that you experienced... It just makes it all so worthwhile. You just yeah. know what the outcome yeah. ultimately is. Praise God. Right. That is so Thank you so much for joining us you tonight. You are Sorry. welcome. God bless you. you. Um, wow. Um, now I'm gonna, I know. I don't think they have like extra strength neosinephrine, so I can actually breathe tonight when I'm sleeping. <laughs> I've been crying so much the whole time. Praise God. I know. Thank you I'm so glad much. I got through it without break. I'm like, I'm just going to break down and ball. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Powerful. Powerful. Much more revealing, Thank you. much more. Uh, in-depth understanding of, of, of uh, things that words just cannot possibly describe. God yeah. bless you for us tonight. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. God bless you all.